Warning, the following episode may contain explicit language. I don't know yet if it will, because we're talking about babies, but, well, it just might. The year is 1900, and Martin A. Cooney is entered into an office of a local inventor to pitch his new idea. Hello there, sir. What brings you to my inventor's office this fine day? Well, my good man, I have an idea of the most astounding potential, and I would like to see if you can help me realize it. That sounds downright smashing. What sort of idea is it? Well, I'm looking for someone to build a particular device for me. Aha. I can build both particular and peculiar devices, so you've come to the right place. Can you describe what you need? Well, I want you to imagine a rectangular frame with glass. I see. Like a display case? Precisely. That's the first part of it. Uh Uh-huh. Will this be an airtight box? Oh, no, no, no. I I think that would quite defeat the purpose. Instead, I'd like to have an air filter of sorts on one end. This is filled with cotton to form a catchment for impurities, you see. We want the air in that glass box to be as clean as possible. Hmm. I think that can be managed. Splendid. Next, the glass display should sit on a wooden box, which contains some sort of apparatus to produce and emit warmth. You see, I want to warm the glass display to a certain degree. I think I'm getting the picture. You want a glass display with purified air therein, sitting atop a wooden box that warms the contents of such. Am I following you? Yes, precisely. Hmm. I don't know that this creation of yours is all that novel. It appears you've reinventing an oven of sorts, good sir. What on earth could be the purpose of this? Well, I mean to put babies in there. What now? Well, it's like it's like a baby oven, but, but like a really weak oven, mind you. Uh, I'm suddenly rethinking my participation in this venture. No, no, no. It's nothing hazardous. I just want to warm the babies a little. Not like an, not like an oven oven, you know. So you want me to build a baby oven that only warms them a little? Well, maybe, maybe it only has like a setting for low heat. Oh, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this at all. Look at sir. There are scores of premature infants that are discarded by hospitals these days. It is my medical opinion that they may be saved if they are provided a clean and warm place to mature. This invention is my way of accomplishing that task. Won't you help me save the lives of these poor helpless babies? Oh, well, on the other hand, I may have had you figured all wrong. So you're a doctor then? Well, I'm kind of a doctor. I mean, I know some doctors. There was this one doctor in France I hung out with a bit. Ah, so you're not really a doctor then. I am Dr. Adjacent. Very well, then. Since business has been slow, I shall agree to help you. I would recommend we develop a steam heating system for this device that would be much safer for the infant in the warming chamber. You mean the baby oven? I would definitely not call it that. No? Um, uh, baby heating chamber. Mm, Still a bit odd. Baby sauna. Absolutely not. Baby incubator. That sounds a bit cold and scientific, but I think it'll work better than your alternatives. Where exactly are you going to use this, and uh, are you and the Mrs. Expecting? Oh, no, 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 nothing like that. I have plans to build dozens of these and use them as a sideshow display at fairgrounds around the country. Oh, wow. Come and look at the amazing baby incubators. I can see it now, 10 cent admission fee. This still seems very ethically troubling to some degree. Actually, given the present year, this is literally going to be one of the most ethically sound displays at any given fairgrounds. Well, that's terrifying. Yes. Yes, it is. Baby ovens. Nope, nope. Incubator. Boring. (laughs) I I like that I wrote baby ovens. (laughs) It's genius. One of those phrases that I'm just proud of. All right. Also a good band name. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. 
as three practicing emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Good evening, gentlemen. Hello. How's it going? Well, it's fairly late. This is a late night recording. Yes, yeah, first will... one. First one. It is. It is. It's, uh, it's what happens when you have three schedules that are all disparate and clash at the wrong times. But either way, I would like to ask you guys a question. Have either of you ever thought of a novel medical invention that could make our day, <coughs> that could make our lives at work easier? I have. I thought it was brilliant. It was brilliant, but then it was also stupid. Oh, good. <laughs> so <laughs> you're, so there, the, problem, Mike, the problem that I was trying to fix was that um, when you're doing dental blocks and you need to aspirate, it's like a two-handed thing, but you're trying to get their cheek out of the way. So you're trying to anesthetize. This is basically injecting into the cheek area to put the teeth to sleep. Mm -hmm. like your Yeah, we've got these do. disposable syringes and they just kind of were like tough to work with. So my thought was to make this plastic molded thing that you could click onto the syringe that had a ring on it that you could put your thumb through and then easily one-handedly aspirate and then inject anesthesia. Hmm. Control mm -hmm. syringe. But there, I mean, mm -hmm. there wasn't anything like that. And then I just stopped thinking about it. I just stopped doing dental blocks. You should have developed that. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about you, Aaron? Well, I have the jokey one, which I always sort of say we should have a, a blow dart apparatus with a sedative in it for certain patients so we don't have to get that close. Pretty sure blow darts have been around for a while, but yeah, where you're going. But you could do that. And then I actually thought up a technique for a procedure, but I never sort of YouTubed how I could do it. So I had a difficult patient. I, you have there's a floppy red tube, and I was trying to put that floppy red tube into the esophagus of the patient because they were bleeding. I was like, you know what? I could just put a second, I could put a second breathing tube in their esophagus on purpose and put the, put the floppy red tube into the rigid red tube and put it in the esophagus. And I thought it was genius. And I was going to make a YouTube video and say, Hey, this is how you could do this. Um, and I won't go into all the minutia because it, it's technical, but yeah, I never filmed it. And it was more of a technique than a invention. Well, Fair enough. I've never had a good idea. So <laughs> oh, you I have an answer. Give it time. <laughs> give it time. You've had lots. What are you talking about? This this podcast? It's a good idea. This podcast is my medical invention. It's official <laughs> and it is there to make everybody's life better. All right. Never mind. Backed into it. And uh, actually, speaking of which, uh, I also kind of wanted to give a little bit of an audience shout out here. I had lots of messages from people I did and even didn't know all that well, uh, helping to clarify my confusion about the movie scene I was talking about in episode five, Terrari, and I was clearly, clearly misremembering the Hot Shots part one movie scene of the food and the eating and the you know, grossness that we talked about. Uh, it was from Hot Shots, definitely. It was not a Top Gun thing. It's all straightened out. Thank you for everybody who commented. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone that this podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. In other words, don't build your baby incubator at home. And with that excellent segue, let's dive into the topic. Can you... And back from edit. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I was asking for a friend. <laughs> no, okay. no. Well, Mike, you, you, you uh, wrote yeah. the word inventorium mm -hmm. on this document, and that makes me... I know. Isn't frightened. that great? It just, it seems like that's, that would be a song on an early Metallica album. Well, they had a song called Santa. That, that sounds like a little, ministry yeah, track. Infantorium. Ooh, ministry mm -hmm. reference. I am proud of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Cooney, what did we say that, how do we pronounce it? You may want, just start, start from okay. the beginning. <laughs> Cooney's Cooney. fine. I think Cooney. Co I don't. We know. had a debate about a how debate. to pronounce this guy's I would, name. I would say the Coney word that, myself, you, but... that we had mentioned. Coney. Coney. Let's do it. Coney. Nope. Coney Island. Coney. Coney's Infantorium. All right. He was born as Michael Cohen, and that's no relation to the modern day Michael. <laughs> the Cohen. infamous yeah. Michael Cohen. Um, born in 1869. So he his professional background is in question. We kind of referenced that in the skit. So when he had come over to the the U.S. He said that he'd studied in Berlin, and then he worked under this another physician in France, and that's where he got his medical training. But it turns out that the immigration has him coming to the U.S. at age 19 in 1888. So it's unlikely he would have had the time to go to medical school. And they, they had asked him, they're like, hey, well, can we see your medical degree? He's like, oh, it's a European. 
It's like, well, can we just see the the copy? He's like, well, I don't have it, <laughs> but just trust me. Awesome. Yeah. It's like when you were in early teen years and you yep. you go off to like a summer camp and you're like, oh, I totally have a girlfriend now, but you can't see her. She's in Canada. She's European. Canadian. I'm an Canadian She's, girl. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's, I, that's... I, have, I have a degree. Trust me, but it's, it's written in European. It's, mm-hmm. it's difficult to read. Sadly, that is the exact same reference I thought of when he said that. <laughs> so like we must have both used that story. <laughs> hey man, adolescence is tough. You get through however you can. But... Well, just think about it. Coming to the new world. It's like, I'm going to start fresh. Might as well AI. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So he comes over. He said he's like 19. He immigrates here in 18. Well, nobody knew how old he was, really. I mean, immigration did, but uh-huh. nobody really knew anything about him. They didn't really know. He's he's like, yeah, I grew up in Poland, and then here's the story. But none of the story ever ever checked out. That actually came up later in some of the uh, people's problems that they had with him. So there were reports that he studied under Dr. Pierre Constant Boudin um, in Paris. He nailed it. Right? Yeah. So apparently he was. So he's thought of as the modern or the founder of modern perinatal medicine. Um, not a lot of people were doing the work that he was doing and Europe really was way ahead of the U S at the time. So he, he had come here because so incubators in Europe were being kind of widely used. Um, they're seeing a lot of benefits to using these with premature infants in the U S people were not doing that at all. And it was kind of, it was an unusual time. There was the, um, like the eugenics movement. There was a lot of weird stuff happening. A lot of reasons as to why they wouldn't recommend this. So, you know, he had kind of pitched his ideas to hospitals. Hospitals weren't interested in it. So he ended up making this traveling exhibit where he put, I guess he called it the child hatchery. So they trialed it in Berlin. (laughs) It was like, wow, this is a smashing success. People are paying good money to come look at tiny babies. And then, (laughs) so he... Well, look, look, you know, it, late 19th century, there's just not much to do. And like, you know, I don't even know, I really don't have much for movies. They can take a photograph and like stare at the still picture or you know, watch babies exist. I mean, mm-hmm. slim pickings, but you take yeah. what you can get. Yeah. So when have you not been happy after you've seen a, a baby? I don't I know. Mean, I mean, I love when people um, bring all in their- the time. It really depends on your disposition towards children. But yeah, I get you. No, okay, fair. That's fair. I, I forgot we have <laughs> we have, but you know I love when the parents bring in their kid who you walk in and the kid's totally fine and you know they're fine and you're not worried about them at all. All you have to do is like do a, a cute little exam and like hold their little baby hand, you know, and like make them laugh, and 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 you're like, yeah, this baby's perfect and beautiful and adorable. And that's my favorite, one of my favorite patients. So yeah, I could I would go to this exhibit, but I I like babies. Do you ever call babies like, breathtaking and then just kind of think? It's actually hilarious. No. You know what I'm referencing? Seinfeld. No. So there was a. I don't. So I don't, there's an oh episode God, where. I watched them all and I don't remember that one. Yeah. Terrible. So um, what's the name of the woman character? The heck? <laughs> Elaine. Elaine. I was thinking Eileen. I knew this was wrong. Elaine. So yes. Elaine, she starts dating a pediatrician. And like for some reason, like he's he met with or like was examining one of his friend's kids. And he just goes, oh, this baby is breathtaking. And then um, she was like, that is the ugliest baby I've ever seen. And then later in the episode, he calls her breathtaking. <laughs> and she's like, he thinks I'm ugly. So then she broke up with him because she thought nice. that he was ugly. Or, That's a good Seinfeld yeah. reason. Yep. That, so that anytime tracks. I see these kids, I'll, well, I'll occasionally say, your baby's breathtaking. And then just like crack up inside. <laughs> Laugh inside. <laughs> is that mean? That's not mean, right? <laughs> I mean, it's good fun. No, it's, it's like, not. No, it's and not. No, nobody knows Seinfeld anymore. It's not you mean. Guys. It's just, it's just a weird sentence. Yeah. Your baby is breath. Actually, I don't think I've ever said that, but I've thought it. But I have called Got people's it. babies cute. <laughs> so, all right. So the, the controversy with this guy was that the medical community in the U.S. at least just didn't believe that incubators were scientific. There weren't enough studies. They didn't think. They thought, you know, the science of this is bad, so we're not going to do it. This is the same medical community that didn't want to wash their hands. And all mm-hmm. these things down the road. So he actually, he was one that was really pushing. He wasn't pushing germ theory so much as he was pushing like really good antiseptic techniques. He made the nurses that worked with the babies wash their hands every time they touched them. And so, hmm. right, it's novel. So yeah, they they wouldn't take him up in hospitals. And this traveling sideshow kind of gained traction. He was making a lot of money doing this. So he's like, you know what? I'm gonna make. I'm gonna bring it all across the country. And then he ended up having two um, long-term exhibits. One was 
in Chicago and the other one was at Coney Island. And I think that one lasted mm. for 40 years, 39 years. That is insanely right? long amount of time. Yeah, so he Jeez. so he builds this infatorium, he called it, on Coney Island. Um, so these incubators that were kind of described in the skit, they made him about five feet tall. Um, they had steel walls. There was a glass front so you could look at the tiny babies. Um, and then boilers fed warm water under the incubators, and they had a thermostat so they could dial in the temperature that they wanted. I feel like that shouldn't go up very high. <laughs> Do you think they Googled like, we're going to put a boiler, we're going to put a pressurized tank under the baby <laughs> what? display case, gentle warming. And I wonder about the thermostats in the 1900s. Maybe they worked. I don't know. I don't know how they could work. Oh, I'm sure yeah. they're solid. They I'm probably sure. still work. Yeah. It's flawless. Filled with mercury. And yeah, flawless. Probably still so are. Then, yeah, air was Never went filtered in and out and they had wool. They had this antiseptic inside of it. So it was, they were trying to clear out the impurities. So they took a lot of measures to make sure that these babies were in a fairly safe environment, rather, you know, safe enough. I mean, it's as safe as the 1900s mm-hmm. gets. You know, it is interesting. Like I, uh, my house was built in what, 1896. So I have people come in and do stuff all the time and they're like, you know, they used to build stuff so simply that it was essentially bulletproof. Like when my house was first built, basically they just built vents and there was a coal burner in the basement and that's how you got heat. But they're like, that's never going to break. You basically, they just built channels for the warm air yeah, and you have coal. And like, so yeah, it was simple, like primitive, but it would never break. So, I mean, maybe it's something similarly. I, I, I mean, people were pretty ingenious back then in the stuff they made just like they are now, but might not have been as pretty or technical. I'm sure it wasn't Bluetooth enabled, <laughs> but it might actually work pretty well. I mean, it lasted for what, almost 50 years. Do you still use it today? No. The coal burner? It, do. Does it, is no, it still in the house though? Well, you can't take it out because it's built into the structure yeah. of the so house. Like, so they actually only use it for about 15 years and then they put radiators in and those are still here. The radiators from the 1910s that's probably. Cool. Hmm. So yeah, it's basically a radiator. That's what this yeah, is. I mean, yeah, it's a baby I guess radiator. That, yeah, as I'm thinking about it now, yeah, I just described how you transfer heat in other areas of life. It's <laughs> 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 like, oh man, I'm a dumbass. No, man. They're five, those are huge, five feet tall. Those are so big. There's a tiny little, what happened? Did they have a lot of babies in them? Uh, one baby per baby monitor. <laughs> why is it so why is One it so baby tall? per display case. That's so big because the baby's going to be, if it's premature, it's going to be like well, maybe five pounds. Yeah, but that's lucky. what he wanted. He wanted the babies to look super small. So like he made the nurses dress them in clothes that were way too big for them and like, and hold them away from their bodies. Like, oh, look how small this baby is. So they needed this big structure to make the baby look tiny. Interesting. Because hmm. nobody's going to pay to go see a regular sized baby. <laughs> 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 you can see that it's one guy that like goes to all the things. He goes to all the baby displays and he's got his tape measure. He's like, oh, this baby's regular size. See? <laughs> he like asks for his money back. I want a mm-hmm. refund. I want a refund. You said it was a tiny baby. <laughs> That's a toddler. <laughs> My money back. They just shave his head. All right. <laughs> Coney's slogan was all the world loves a baby. Um, so yeah, so his exhibit ran from 1903 when he first built it, the Infantorium on Coney Island to 1943. He had a full staff, so he employed uh, full-time nurses that lived at the expo. And again, the structure, you can kind of imagine, I initially was thinking it was a tent, but they had some pictures of it. And it looks like uh, it's it's a fairly big structure. And you would just go in and like it was just an open kind of gallery where all these baby things were. And <laughs> the, the building on the outside, it kind of looked like, have you ever been to Ripley's Believe It or Not? in florida just this weird no, it's I've just like a weird it, looking building it looked like that but that's you know yeah. it's like probably some of the mystery there's a building that's built to look like it's upside down in wisconsin dells really there's like it's like a mystery yeah it's all um but that's not close on the rock yeah, is it? it looks looks like it, no although i've heard i haven't been there but the kids think that place is hilarious these nurses live on site full-time and apparently the cost I guess for adjusted money is four hundred and five dollars just for that's your entire care, uh, but then it to care the for infant. the infant yep. the whole the time it's there. That is actually super. So yeah, cheap. fifteen bucks back then. He didn't charge the parents, and I don't know. I think he would have gotten into a little a 
a grayer ethical area if he was charging the parents to borrow their babies to charge money. <laughs> so, well, I mean, that would hold true if he was in a tent, but I think if he's in an actual structure, yes. it seems yeah. legitimate. Yeah, the structure gave him some credence. So yeah, the, the entrance fees, they covered the cost of the salaries of the nurses and the care of the babies. And there was all sorts of different, think about like the fair, you know, like you go in and you look at the pigs and then, oh, look at those pigs are running around in a circle. And <laughs> so the same thing was here. It's like, you go in like, here's the babies that are sleeping in the, these, you know, gigantic structures. And then here's the babies that are getting fed. And when I was researching this, it, they made it sound like the nurses were breastfeeding him. He was a big proponent of breastfeeding and, and they use breast milk, but the nurses breastfed the babies so i wonder if i mean they had recently they must have recently delivered yeah i mean that's the concept of a wet nurse that's uh that's like that that is a very old concept somebody who's recently gravid who can produce a lot of breast milk and using that to feed for infants whose mothers could not back in the day that was uh that was a fairly well, common yeah, practice wonder- was that not a big deal back then because it's interesting because like when you have people breastfeeding in public it is kind of a thing now like some oh, yeah, people are no. thrown off by it and such, and it, they shouldn't be, right? I mean, it's just you know, it's that's what they're I for. Know that. Back so. then, that was that was almost like a, um, it was like almost a specialty, if you will. Well, just just yeah. imagine somebody breastfeeding someone else's baby, though. Would that be weird? <laughs> oh, right, right. Well, back then, though, <laughs> culturally, uh, there was literally there was a there was a term for it. Yes, wet nurse. Yeah, they didn't exactly have like you can just go pick up formula. But how did we find these people then? <laughs> I would think it could be a future episode, but I also think we should never do that episode. <laughs> so, yeah, so the the babies that were cuddled, they want they wanted the babies. So, Coney's big thing was kind of normalize premature babies. You know, like don't be afraid of them, mm-hmm. although he was making them kind mm-hmm. of a sideshow. So, he was like, you want to you want to <laughs> cuddle these babies, you want to treat these babies as if you would treat any other baby. Well, this was a time as I think either you said before, or I saw kind of looking at this as well, that like hospitals just did not take care of premature infants. Yeah, they didn't. They refused. And that's why. Did they just, yeah. what did they do with them? They just let them die? Yep. They didn't think they had the disposition to survive life. And then they would carry all sorts of other genetic problems that would pass on to the next generation. So they just were like, yep, there's no place for this person here. So you got to go. So people would, that's yeah, rude. they would be discharged from the hospital carrying these like tiny babies and they would go to coney's infantorium and be like take care of my baby and he would only he would care for Mm. them until they were like strong enough to go back home he didn't keep any of them as far as i know (laughs) i mean it's the warehouse problem at that point where are we gonna put all these babies too many babies (laughs) as they were getting these babies prepared for viewing (laughs) this just sounds weird so he would bathe them in lukewarm water every day. I don't know. That's probably a good idea. Yeah, reasonable. And then, yeah, so they were given a dose of brandy as well. Is that just to make sure that they were all chill for when the people came to look at them? <laughs> I don't know. I saw it in the sure. article. It was like, sure. if they were capable, were given a small dose of brandy. I mean, was it? Which baby is capable of having the brandy? The mature babies? Yeah. I mean, the baby with the... The baby that's already holding shadow. a cigar. Yeah. The baby with... Blink two times if you want a small <laughs> dose of brandy. <laughs> I mean, that's still a, that's a time honored teething remedy and a sleeping remedy. I was told at some point, so, you know, if you just, you know, if you just rub a little bit of whiskey on their gums, you know, the night will go more easily. So Yeah. I mean, I uh, think we've all yeah, that, heard that. Some of us may have been given whiskey when we were coughing our heads off as children too. Yep. Yep. I wonder if that's just because that's the drink that was out at the time because you wouldn't shut up and your parents are trying to sleep and they're just hammering the bottle. Like here, just <laughs> take some of this. It works for me. Go to bed. Oh no, this was a this this was a. I come from a partly and very much Irish family, and that was that was uh, without exaggeration. Grandpa's cough re- cough mm-hmm. syrup and remedy was uh, was essentially what was a tiny hot toddy. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. I still remember that. His I guess his food of choice was breast milk straight from the breast. So the there's some I guess description of using bottles. But some infants were given breast milk that was spooned through the nose. Why? I read that and I was like, why would is... they? I think it's very reasonable to breastfeed your baby through its nose. So, Coney, he didn't want wet nurses to smoke, eat red meat, or drink alcohol. 
because he thought that that would just degrade the quality of the breast milk. Mm. Yeah, he's right. Yeah. Kind of mm-hmm. right. Yep. Stumbled into one there. Yep. Well, I would I would think it would have had to have been pretty interesting to be the guy trying to like draw the people to the baby cuddling tent at the fairgrounds. If only we had some sort of way to consider that possibility. On the boardwalk of Coney Island circa 1905, Coney's Infantorium display is up and running. A carnival barker is out front trying to encourage ticket sales to curious fairgoers. Step right up, step right up, come one, come all to see the famous babies of the Coney Island Infantorium. Say there, sir, did you say Infantorium? I sure did, good man. For the measly price of ten cents, you and yours can experience the thrills of this world-famous Infantorium. Well, what's an Infantorium exactly? For the price of admission, you will pass through this curtain into the new world of modern medicine. Herein lies a life-saving display. Premature infants cozied up in pristine glass incubators for your viewing. Did you just say incubators? For babies? What? You mean like baby ovens? No, 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 no. They're they're not ovens. They're incubators. You see, they keep the babies warm until they mature. You're familiar with chickens, are you not, good sir? I sure am. Well, imagine that instead of warming chicken eggs to hatch, we have many babies in incubators of their own, keeping them safe and secure and cozy until... Are you trying to tell me that you have a human hatchery in there? Where do you get the eggs? Uh, No, that's not how humans work. We don't hatch from eggs. Why aren't these babies in a hospital? This seems rather garish. Well, ma'am, we're here because hospitals haven't quite caught on to the idea of saving these little ones. In fact, we tried to sell our invention to all the hospitals of renown only to be met with scorn and derision. Can you imagine? How cruel that seems. How long does it take for them to hatch? No, sir, we don't hatch babies from eggs. That's not where babies come from. I was using the chicken incubator as an example. If there's no baby eggs, then what do I get for my 10 cent entry fee? I just look at the babies? Well, sort of. I'd I'd rather think of it as marveling at the efforts our nurses have gone to to help nurture these little ones to health. You can see how we wash and feed these helpless babies. We take every effort to ensure they are clean and free of the ravages of disease. I dare say that your entry fee also goes to pay for their care, so you'll be doing a good deed by paying for your admission. Well, that guy at the tent over there says I can win a goldfish if I land a ring on the ring toss board. How do I go about winning me one of those babies? Uh, I think you're... you really missed the point oh, of this. Oh, hush, Bobby. You know we're not here to win any more children to take care of. Mr. Carnival Barker, sir, while I appreciate what it is you're trying to do here, I think it just seems a little exploitative to me. Aren't you profiting off the misfortune of these little ones and putting them on sort of dehumanizing display? Isn't there some other sort of way to provide care for them? Well, it's 1905, so... No, this is actually the best we can do. Hell, the World's Fair literally has displays of South Pacific Islanders as if they're a racist zoo exhibit. So this here infantorium is by comparison way less problematic, as I'm sure you'll agree. Once you step right in... I don't think I could see fit to take part in this. Let's go elsewhere, Bobby. Ah, uh, hon, I kind of want to see the baby. Come along now. You never let me do what I want. What if they got two-headed baby in there, or a bearded baby? I would pay ten cents to no, see that. we are leaving. I'll put a beard on the baby for twenty cents. Really? What about a two-headed baby? Um, no. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I started thinking of the whole story of that couple. Man, that's an interesting it's, pair. It's, it's a weird couple that I thought mm-hmm. of. <laughs> These are the people that float around my brain when I'm at work, and you wonder what I'm doing when I stare off into the distance. Nice. Welcome back. I, for one, am sure that bit was accurate in every way. Where did we leave off? Baby side show ethics. Yeah, so the medical community and child protection groups and everybody seemed to have a problem with Coney except for the people and the parents of the children that he was helping. Um, so they were saying that he was using the infants for monetary gain, and he did charge an entrance fee for people to see these babies, but he also provided health care to them for free. Uh, I mean, you know, the, that 
kind of cover the cost of the care of these babies. And nobody else wanted to do it at the time. Nobody else thought that you should do it at the time. So he argued, you know, this is the last chance the babies are going to get. He's kind of like, if he doesn't take care of them, nobody will. So as we kind of touched on before, the hospitals would release premature babies just because they said, you know, there's very little chance that this baby is going to survive. So, you know, we're not going to have them take up a hospital bed. You just go and have your baby die at home or do fine. You know, it was just kind of left to nature. I wonder what the, I don't know if you came across this. I didn't see it, but I wonder what the youngest baby he had I think was. the, well, the small, I think it was. To survive, I, I think I it was say. 28 weeks. And I think it was less than two pounds. But I could be wrong. I might have been looking at like, well, incredible. I might have been looking at like modern day survival. I looked at a couple articles that talked about premature. No, it's funny because this actually exists up until like 1995. There were still articles that were suggesting that like premature infants probably shouldn't get the care that they get because the likelihood of survival mm. is so low. We talk about futility in medicine. Mm. You know, like mm. it's futile to take care of these patients. So you probably shouldn't. I mean, you just think about that viability that it just i feel like that the gestational age goes a certain age lower where lower. it's like it's it's feasible and then yeah yeah but even feasible i mean I, you know it's kind of like cpr right we don't talk about the actual success rate i mean i think viability is down to what 21 weeks but the, the odds are not in your well, favor yeah. at that age yeah. that you're going to be but on the flip side if you get cpr in the show baywatch it is always successful true because yeah. of the breastfeeding part accurate <laughs> In 95, 110% success mm -hmm. rate. Always cough up the water. Yep. Always water. Yep, always. Okay, so copycat operations. Yeah, so the, yeah, well, a bunch right. popped up because everybody's like, this Coney guy, he's making a killing showing people babies. So like all these different, you know, expositions popped up and, and none of them had the standards that Coney had. So, you know, the the conditions weren't great. That's when people started to really have a problem with it was because of all the other people that were doing this. You know, they started running articles in the medical literature, kind of trying to damage his reputation. That's probably where a lot of the story of like the question of whether or not he was a physician had come up was probably around this time, like trying to get him to disappear. But so 1933, he sets up. So there's the World's Fair. Everybody loves the World's Fair back then. So sets that up in Chicago, ran it for two years. And then they didn't say what hospital, but a major hospital in Chicago then saw this and the medical guy at this hospital was talking with Coney and they're like, you know what, we're going to, we're going to bring these into the hospital. We're going to actually try this. Um, so Chicago was kind of the hmm. epicenter of perinatology or neonatology. Yeah. So each time he tried to close one of these expositions, he took the incubators to the hospitals. It was like, I'm just going to give you these. You could take them. I'll show you how to use them. And he was always met with no, except for in Chicago hmm. and then later in New York. Uh, but yeah, the, like the dark turn of this story is really that that eugenics movement was kind of like a dark cloud that kind of hung over all of this. And there were people in medicine that were saying like some pretty crazy stuff. And I think their argument was like, these these babies aren't going to survive to adulthood. So like, don't waste time and resources on them. But some of the slogans they came up with were pretty bad. Like one slogan was killed, effective, save the nation. Like it sounds really. That's pretty. That's geez. that should have been workshop yeah, yeah. a lot. Well, yeah, it sounds like yeah. It might have <laughs> been like in the room for a that predecessor one. to something else that happened later. You know, it was like not great. Um, so they referred to preemies as weaklings, and then there was this anonymous author that was attacking Coney that said that you know he was actually worried that premature infants would survive and transmit their deficiencies, deformities, and vices to the next generation. And really before Coney, Oof. previews were just kind of like, you know, let nature take over. If you survive, great. If you don't, great. This is definitely not the purview of this podcast, but I had uh, recently read something about Charles Lindbergh and the like, inf the infamous uh, Lindbergh baby. And one of the major theories was because he was a big eugenicist hmm. and turns out not a not a very good American a hero, if you yeah, will, but right. he's got a dark oof. side. Well, no, he had a child that uh, um, reportedly had a bunch of health defects, and uh, and so and this was the kid that was kidnapped, so to speak, and eventually found dead. And uh, a fair amount of the story centers on whether or not he actually, because he was such a strong believer in eugenics, orchestrated the whole thing because he did didn't want this to be part of his bloodline which I don't, I don't know if that's true, but 
I mean, he was a pretty it's hardcore. About as dark as this. He's a pretty yeah. hardcore Nazi too, wasn't he? So I don't know. If yeah, he was. He was him. definitely was. I don't know how he got to Nazis from Infantorium, but we got you know, here somehow. So, I, so I've mentioned this television show Jones, several yeah. times, but the Nick, it, I mean, it takes place in this time mm-hmm. and they do a big eugenics arc. It's mm-hmm. like phrenology, you know, it's like where, mm-hmm. where medicine goes. You think about all these alternate timelines, like what if one of these things actually stuck, you know, and now you're yeah. like, God, the, everything looks so different. Yeah. That's the dark universe turn. Yeah, that is Earth six months. Yeah, it's sort of, I mean, it was sort of misappropriated um, early understanding of genetics. And I, it's like one of those things that we could cover in an article, but I don't think there's a lot of humor in it. It's just awful. It's kind of the only thing I know about genetics yeah, a, really is like, like how to determine which pea is going to be yellow and which pea is going to be green. <laughs> <laughs> or wrinkled, wrinkled or smooth. I don't even yeah, remember right. that. Wrinkled, smooth, yellow, green. Uh, how many, yeah, so he... He claims, and I, I probably believe him, even though I don't believe anything else about him. Um, it seemed like he was a, a man of integrity, did this for a specific reason. So he said that he had saved about 6,500 babies. His mortality rate was 15%. But prior to this, 75% of all premature infants died. Hmm. So, I mean, did I mean, he, you think about all like the founders of medicine or whatever, like this guy did more for one, like his specific field than a lot of other people did just with this one little idea that nobody wanted to listen to. Um, yeah. So yeah. So yeah. the first facility in New York that would take care of premature infants, so had incubators in hospitals opened up in 1939. And this was 36 years after he started his thing on Coney Island. So they, they said they would, they, they would care for these babies, but then the first, like, I guess, infantorium in a hospital, <laughs> what do they call them? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, are we talk- oh, for yeah. preemies? <laughs> Neonatal ICU? Well, yeah, something like, that. it wasn't an ICU, but we'll just call it an inventorium for mm. now. I'm going to refer to our neonatal intensive care unit as the inventorium from now on. Yes. So in 1943, this hospital opens up and they've got a unit that takes care of premature infants. We'll just leave it at that. And then uh, a couple months later, Coney just said, well, my work here is done. This is what I wanted to have happen. So then he closed his inventorium that year and then died penniless. It didn't say anything about it's what the he end spent of, his money on. If he ever made money, maybe he never made money on this. It's the end of all 19th century dramas. Died penniless. Oh, uh, like Tesla. Tesla, like, oh, yeah, it's brilliant. Mind. Yeah. Tesla was the first thing yeah. I thought of, too. And that, that picture up, you could probably see that picture of him. He's like, got these sallow cheeks, skin and bones. He's kind of staring off into space, like this brilliant mind that just dies in some hotel. It's gross. It's bad. Well, that's I, I do think that they're like the first thought I had was there's something painfully real about the guy who starts the baby side show with actual decent intentions and then later dies penniless. Mm-hmm. I feel like he probably should have just leaned into the exploitation role a little bit more and he probably mm-hmm. would have been but rich. But that's what makes the yeah. story so beautiful it's like like you can look back now like all these people thought you're a bad guy you're doing the bad thing but then you look back on him like wow he actually did a really great thing and he wasn't in it to enrich himself he was in it because he wanted he proved it too like they opened up this and maybe he was like oh nobody's gonna come want to see my babies i'll just go to the hospital but you know he's like (laughs) this is what i wanted so i'm done well that is all we have for today we do appreciate everyone listening and if you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback we can be reached through our website www.poorhistorianspod all one word dot com there you can find links to our social media sites we take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com or if you're old fashioned throw a brick through our window until next time we are Aaron Max and Mike signing off and reminding you that modern medicine sure has come a long way and we do appreciate that and write us emails. We really do like it. We get shout outs. Who doesn't like shout outs? Wait, we do shout outs? Yeah, he did oh, a yeah, shout out this right. time. Oh, that was great. <laughs> you know what? I'll, I'd like to do a shout out too. Okay, go I'm for it. i to give a shout out to D's Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Got him.
I don't like peas anyway, so it's not going to be a problem for me. So, uh, doing the squares in biology class, I don't even like I peas. Hate, Why am I doing peas? This? Are disgusting. They're disgusting. I love really? peas. They're great vegetables. Yeah, so my daughter, yeah, no, you, you know, they're good in salads. They're very. You, know, you can put them. No, warm they're dishes, disgusting. Cool it's the grossest vegetable that God oh, ever no, created. No. <laughs> squash is the grossest vegetable. Everybody knows that. Squash is a fruit. I don't know. Is it? <laughs> I just said it definitively. Both of you guys yeah. believe me. <laughs> it's not, I don't know what I'm it a is. Doctor, not a horticulturist. <laughs> the grossest vegetable. You're going to go over yes. okra. Yeah, yeah over okra is actually pretty good. Lima okra beans. Pretty bad. Yep. Wow. Yeah, uh, so my daughter was doing like this school thing, you know, kind of transitioning to high school, and they they do lunch there. So like today's lunch, it's such a weird combination of food, but it was like. You know, like the government pizza that they give you that's like kind of undercooked. It's got the little sausage on it. It's just like yes. mm-hmm. everything's all soggy. And then there was a pile of peas. And she's like, I don't like the, you know, I don't need the peas. They're like, you're going to take the peas. She's like, what am I going to do with these peas? I'm not going to eat them. She's like, you could throw them away. That's a waste. And w- <laughs> like, who eats peas? <laughs> I, I love oh. peas. I just told you I, I love peas. <laughs> it's like a cup full you earlier not. today. <laughs> Yeah, you put butter. I, and honestly, I don't know if I can continue this good. podcast with you guys. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're right at the end, so uh, not this episode. Like the whole thing. Peas are so gross. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, just the God. way that they mush. Peas. Yeah, they're like overcooked potato, like mini overcooked potatoes. With the, only if you overcook them. If you don't overcook them, they're not overcooked. Yeah. Maybe you're just doing they're it like wrong. Little bursts of what flavor. Do you mean? Yeah, you're just they're doing amazing. it wrong. You have bad. Do peas. you like cherry tomatoes? Yeah. Uh, no, I like Romas. I don't like cherry tomatoes. The cherry tomatoes are too, so you bite into them and they're way too, they're like grapes, but then it's salty. And I don't like that juxtaposition. It's a They have to be the exact surprise. correct firmness. What about your peas? Will you eat any indiscriminate pea? Like, let's say there's a bunch of peas on the table. No, no, like, no, no. Oh, no, I'm going to no, grab no, no. this handful. I, I literally make, and I eat, I will eat a cup of them Please at a time. Don't. Like, yeah, don't but... ever do that around me. Like, I, my... <laughs> <laughs> I don't indiscriminately eat any pea, though. I, it's got to be a pea that's properly prepared and seasoned, you know, and, and not overcooked and not like one at a time. How do you, how no, do you season one at a time. Time. Like, you, you put them into lines like Halstead would. <laughs> I can just imagine, like, for me, if I was going to season peas, I would put them in a cup and then just take a gigantic shit on them because I think they're that gross. <laughs> You're, you're confusing peas with cilantro. <laughs> Do you taste soap when you eat cilantro? The worst garnish. Cilantro is the worst garnish. Yeah, cilantro it's, is. If you chop it finely and put awful. it in a stew oh, or see, something, I love maybe. Cilantro. But no, it ruins everything. It's, it's called coriander. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't even like parsley because it looks like cilantro. <laughs> True story. I let beans slide because I don't see the peas inside. <laughs> How do you feel about mushrooms? Because like the them. way you describe peas, that's, oh God, I hate those things. They're slimy and they grow in poop. Mm-hmm. And yeah, no. And they look like, yeah, no. Anyway, I know this like was like. Little a... alien dolphin penises. They're <laughs> terrible. I, they don't know why anyone can eat mushrooms. Um, I've never seen a dolphin penis. <laughs> right? They could look like that. That You don't even know. That like could be exactly penis? what they look like. <laughs> uh Anyway, peas are gross.